here today um, to introduce to you a tool that we use consistently in our facility um, that we're really excited about. So let's dive in. There are our object objectives for the day. You can go ahead and read through those. So we want to start out by just um, hearing a little bit from you guys. Um, a lot of what we're talking about today is going to be having to do with supporting care partners through the discharge process. Um, so we want to know what are your biggest stressors related to discharge, and we want you to yell them out because we're going to write them on the board. <laughs> biggest stressors. Which, thank you. Insurance. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is terrible. Okay. What else? What else? Adequate support. Mm, right. That's a good one. What else? Come on. Training. Mm -hmm. Family training. Ignore my terrible writing. Anything else? Community resources. Mm -hmm. Terrible spelling. Say again. <laughs> yes. Sorry if I'm like too enthusiastic. I'm like, yes, I feel that. <laughs> All of that, <laughs> All of that I feel. Um, I will say, do you want to flip to the next one? Yes, I do. Um, this kind of all got started for us in 2019. And at that time, we were feeling these even more enthusiastically. It was. Right around this time, we're starting to feel this real crunch and change of length of stay. You can see on the chart up there how much that had changed from 2015 to 2019, both in our traditional rehab program and in our disorders of consciousness program. Um, significantly shorter lengths of stay for all of our persons served. You can see it's continued to go down to tw through 2022, where we're at um, right now, just at that like low 70s on average. Um, and then just disregard 2020 because COVID. Um, but we were feeling that crunch very heavily, especially towards the end of our, dis our um, person served length of stay, right? That last one to two weeks where it was kind of like chaos all the time. It felt like we were trying to make everything come together in the shortest amount of time and make sure that we could get person, home, person served home with their families as safely as possible. Um, we were really feeling a push towards FIMS, right? Those like functional changes that insurance wanted to see and not as much feeling like we were getting the time to do the things that person served wanted, reaching their hopes and their dreams and their goals, and we were having to focus on just buying them more time with us. Um, we were getting some really good information on the front end from our social workers and our clinical liaisons when person served would come to us, um, kind of to fill us in on what the potential length of stay might be, the plan for discharge, but finding that that information wasn't staying consistent. Um, plans were changing midway through when we hit that scramble or we were finding out just pieces of the puzzle that we didn't know from the start. Um, and with all the craziness and stress, we knew there was a problem, um, but we didn't really have the time and didn't really know how to tackle it. So when better to take a break than when you're really crazy busy, right? So Emily and I decided that we were going to go to the AOTA conference. Um, and at that conference, we went to a presentation um, by Casey Stepanski called Caring for Our Caregivers. And we will let you meet Casey. Hello. Nope. Somebody play that video for us, please. Hi, my name is Casey Stepanski. I'm an occupational therapist, and I work in inpatient rehabilitation. rehabilitation. I, went I went back, back for, for my doctorate, doctorate in 2017-2018. And as, as part of my doctoral work, work I wanted to create, create an evidence-based caregiver training, training program to support the hospital and uh, implement a new protocol that will be most supportive of caregivers wanting to take their loved ones with brain injury home. I looked into the literature to see what was available, what best practices were out there, and there's not a ton. At the time, there wasn't a ton of literature uh, in supporting that transition specifically in inpatient rehab. 
and given the current length of stay. So uh, many of my clients would be at our facility two to four weeks max, and too often I felt like we were waiting too long in the process to start having conversations with caregivers. So um, Barbara Lutz had written an article that identified that talking to caregivers early was incredibly, incredibly important and identified specific themes of what you want to talk to family members about as a way to build rapport, but also as a way to start a conversation. So I used that article specifically and the themes identified, as well as a couple other evidence-based examples of caregiver training, um, many from other countries. There isn't a ton in the United States to uh, use as examples. And I built a, a quick and easy caregiver assessment that was 10 questions long to at least start a conversation with caregivers. I did recognize that just due to the length of stay that was allotted many times by private insurance or um, Medicare, Medicaid, we were limited in what we were capable of changing. We still had significant change, change but very few of our clients were independently discharged. Therefore, there was a need present that somebody was going to have to continue that care after they left our facility. We weren't going to get them to a independent, modified independent as they were prior to their injury because we just didn't have enough time. They didn't have enough time to recover. So with that knowledge and with that shorter length of stay, something has to be done. Something had to be done to support that transition home. So Emily and I are sitting in this presentation feeling seen, feeling heard. We had a ton of aha moments, <clears throat> excuse me, throughout it. The presentation as a whole just felt like a yes to us. Um, and it kind of just empowered us to do something about it. So we were super jazzed, really excited to take this on. Um, but it was a little bit more of a wishful thinking type thing. Um, we weren't confident we were going to have time to really take it on. But um, due to excessive flight delays, we were in, stuck in the airport for 14 plus hours um, on our way back from this conference. Um, we had time for a new project. Um, so we had emailed Casey and wanted kind of her 10, list of 10 questions. And we modified from that questions that were more applicable to our setting. Um, we also collaborated with our neuropsychologist and big reason for that being we wanted to incorporate psychosocial needs as well as <clears throat> neurobehavioral challenges that might come up and just really accessible language for anyone kind of going through it. We also collaborated with our rehab director, Dave, to get the green light um, to kind of take this on and to kind of really invest in it. Life happens. We got back and it took us a little while, but by fall 2019, we had done some things to start really implementing it. We had done an in-service with the team, therapy team. We had already started doing case-by-case -case trials. Um, <clears throat> we were getting informal feedback from the team, as well as from family members, anyone who was really partaking in it to kind of modify it along the way. Um, and so we'd kind of just started this gradual progression to a more frequent use. So I know this is really small and hard to see. I apologize for that. We did want to give you guys a little bit of a taste of what the care partner needs assessment looks like that we're using um, in the inpatient right now, but also didn't want you to feel too attached to this one. As we know, it can be modified to use in a lot of different settings. Um, so biggest thing with this is that we wanted to make sure that we were addressing the components that Casey talked about in her presentation, as well as what was referenced in the Lutz article, and then kind of making that fit our setting. So we're looking at making sure that we're talking about care partners' physical ability to actually assist their loved one, um, including their emotional response to the situation and kind of where they're at with that coping process, how ready they might be to take that on, in addition to the trauma that they're experiencing. Um, talking about the strength of the care partner um, and person served bond and relationship prior to the injury, you know, is that um, a strong relationship to start with. What are we building from and how do we move forward from here to make sure that that's stable? Um, we're talking about previous caregiver experience. What have you done before? What are you comfortable with from pre previous experiences? Um, and then also talking about any 
pre-existing health conditions that might exist for that care partner. Do you have arthritis that might make it harder to lift or low back pain, but also do you have any history of anxiety or maybe depression that could play a factor in your taking on this big new role? Um, we talk a lot in there about daily routines and schedules, any other roles that um, loved ones might have to take on. Are you also a parent? Are you also working? Um, what else does your day look like that you need to make time for for you? Um, and just the general ability to sustain that caregiving role. We felt like it was really important for us to have some of these visuals. So you can see that top um, line going across has those body weight definitions on it. So wanted to make sure we got away from that FIM kind of clinical language and talking about actual accessible language that makes sense to family members. Are you lifting a lot of body weight for your loved one? Are you lifting a little bit of their body weight? And then having them actually, when we can, circle that on the paper or highlight it, getting them kind of that extra piece of commitment into the process. Yes, this is what I can take on on a consistent basis. Um, same thing for the timeline down below. That one is, what, um, when are you typically able to provide direct supervision or um, assistance for your loved one? I usually try to clarify on this. When can you be awake with your loved one, right? We have a lot of people who tend to say, I can be there all the time. Okay, can you stay awake 24 hours a day, every day in a row? And so we're having them again kind of commit and dive into this, hoping to make it more concrete of what is that actual level that I can jump into. Um, for us, this is usually about a 30 to 45 minute meeting that we're sitting down for with person served and their family members. Um, the more family members that we can have present in the conversation, the better. We've found that if we have one family member talking for another person who might be providing care, we don't always get the most accurate picture. So the more people that can be there in person, the better. Um, that said, sometimes the person served themselves is there, sometimes they're not. Um, sort of depends on the family's comfort level, right? Can I be open and have a candid conversation with this team about where I'm at if my loved one is in the room? If not, that, that's okay. We don't have to have them there. We can have this conversation separately. There's also other situations. Maybe the person served is in DOC and are able to actively participate in it. Or maybe there's someone that's in Rancho Spore and they're easily agitated, escalated. We wouldn't want to put them in that position so they wouldn't necessarily be appropriate to participate. Mm -hmm. um, and then the lead into this conversation, I always try to preface with, there's no right or wrong answer to these questions, right? This is an open conversation. It's a starting off point for us. Definitely not a pass-fail test. We want to just get some information on the table because our role here is to help you through what you have, not what the right answers are. Um, before we dive too much deeper, we just want to throw out to everyone that we know you are all having these conversations lately, right? Thank you, Dave. Um, we know you're all having these conversations. Um, we know that discharge planning is on your mind. We know that training is on your mind. You're always all probably advocating for your person served, but we just really want to um, emphasize the fact that we found so much value in having this structured assessment. Um, it really has helped us iron out kinks along the way. Um, and just really has been super beneficial to have that platform to jump off of. I'm managing too many things. Sorry, guys. This is just a slide that's kind of comparing Casey's setting um, and her assessment to our setting and our modified assessment. <clears throat> the biggest takeaways on this, excuse me, sorry. Um, are that her length of stay is much shorter than ours, um, as well as it is a standarding, standard onboarding practice um, in her setting. So no matter who, anyone that comes through their doors, they're completing this with. We are more on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, as a team, we kind of flag um, maybe situations that might be a little dicier or knowing when there's conversations that haven't been had maybe as thoroughly as they should um, right off the bat. <clears throat> This is also a good slide because I feel like it shows that this could be adapted or modified for any setting. Um, you know, we changed quite a bit of it from Casey's original, um, but that could be done by anyone. 
Um, just really quickly, this one is a little bit, um, just a graphic to help you see through the timeline of what those look like on the top with Casey's setting in her caregiver needs assessment versus ours on the bottom, um, what we're utilizing as the care partner needs assessment. Um, because of her short length of stay, that's really more of a strict, straight and narrow path that they're on for us. We're finding that because we're lucky enough to have a little flexibility in our length of stay, we're able to revisit some of those conversations, some of those steps in the process, and kind of go back and forth as needed. All right, so today we picked two case studies to share with you. Um, we think that these are great examples of how the CPNA can really facilitate these early conversations about discharge, um, illuminate any real major barriers, uh, expedite training um, and education around the person served needs. So the first person that we're gonna talk about is Rod. Um, Rod is a farmer. He lives with his wife in a modular home in a rural area. Um, he lives nearby to a small town where the rest of his family members live. He has a daughter and two sons who live about 15 minutes away there. Um, he enjoys spending time with his family, attending his grandchildren's sporting events, um, and does come from a close-knit and supportive farming community. Um, unfortunately, after having frostbite on his toe, Rod eventually had to have a left below knee amputation. Um, and while he was rehabbing from that amputation, had a right MCA, CVA during his acute phase of rehab. So when Rod came to us after that acute rehab stay, um, he was experiencing many of the deficits that are really common with right CVA, um, left hemibody weakness, uh, flat affect, reduced insight to into what some of his deficits were, um, some left inattention. He had some open wounds on that amputation site was dealing with incontinence of both bowel and bladder, um, and then was also battling some chronic hip pain that made it harder for him to move. Um, at that time, he needed assistance of two people for almost everything he was doing. That includes using a, a mechanical lift for transfers or a slide board with the help of two people, um, or having two people help him with most of his ADL, so things like toileting, bathing, dressing. Um, we found out again from our clinical liaisons and social workers that plan A for Rod was to return to his daughter's house, not his house, um, because they had an accessible home and would be able to provide some supervision there. If he wasn't able to go to his daughter's house, they were open to some conversations about transitioning to a care center that would be closer to home. Um, we knew because Rod had Medicare that he was likely going to be in the 30 to 60 day length of stay range. Um, but knowing at the same time that they were going to be watching those FIM gains pretty strictly and that we would have to meet some really structured um, FIM gains in order to extend his length of stay at all. <laughs> so we're going to break out a little bit and let you guys talk in your tables. Um, we've got a list of questions up here, but the biggest ones that I want you guys to think about are what red flags do you see with what we already know about Rod and his discharge plan? And then um, talk a little bit about what you want more information on. What questions do you have? What can we help you learn about Rod? Abby, not yet. Okay.
Just FYI, that's for the next case study, so ignore that that she's handing out. Okay, so you guys might have guessed already, since we have the whiteboard up here, we wanna know what questions you have so that we can keep track and make sure that we're answering them as we go through Rod's information. So holler out some questions that you wanna know more about, things you wanna know about Rod and his, his discharge plan. What's the daughter's house set up? Who else lives in the house? Does she work? What was that last one? I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Does she have a second person? That's a good question. Do they have the finances to pay for the equipment? Yeah. What was that one? Yeah. There's a one. Yes. Any that we missed? So this is at the start of his inpatient. Oh, you're thinking for discharge. I got you. Are they still going to be doing therapies? Mm -hmm. Lots of questions, right? That's like exactly where we're at. <laughs> Um, we're going to do our best to work through and try to answer some of these questions here. But before we go on, I'm curious how many of you think that plan A is going to be successful for Rod? A show of hands. To go home. Yeah, to home to daughter's house. Okay. okay. So we um, were able to get the care partner needs assessment scheduled with Rod's family about three weeks into his stay. Um, just for anybody who's not familiar with on, life, on with Life's inpatient process, we're meeting as a team, the rehab team, within the first couple days of the stay and usually flagging, um, do we think that this person served would be appropriate for this conversation? What kind of questions do we have? Um, and then at that time, we're talking about when is the appropriate time to bring up this conversation. In Rod's case, we were talking about that at his first conference, which was about a week and a half to two weeks into his stay getting it on family's radar so that we could get a specific date and time scheduled to have this. We knew that it was gonna happen. Um, we sat down with Rod's wife, his daughter, and his granddaughter. This is one of those cases where Rod actually wasn't present. Um, again, family just felt a little more comfortable being open in that conversation without Rod there. And Rod knew we were having the conversation and was very okay with not taking part in it. <laughs> Um, so what we found out from having that conversation is that family can piece together that 24-7 supervision. They're able to sort of patchwork their schedules to make sure that someone is always there, but it's likely only going to be one person at a time. Um, we found out that his wife is able to provide that supervision. She's one of those members, but isn't able to provide any physical help. She has a history of arthritis and will be the first one to tell you that her short stature makes things difficult. <laughs> Um, so she was pretty hesitant about taking on any of those tasks. 
Luckily for Rod, um, he does have quite a few other family members who felt very comfortable giving a heavy amount of cyst up to maximal support for him if needed. We did talk a little bit about intimate cares. Who's going to be the one or who's going to be comfortable helping with um, toileting, hygiene, and bathing? Um, wife and daughter both said they would be comfortable providing some support with that. Rod has a granddaughter who's a CNA, and so while she provided those cares in her job, felt like I just want to maintain the role as granddaughter here, and I would like to shy away from that as, if possible. Very understandable. And again, one of the reasons we're having this conversation. Um, as far as comfort level with medical cares, because um, Rad, Rod's granddaughter and his daughter both had a little bit of healthcare background, they said they were pretty comfortable taking on anything that he might need for medical support and we're very open to doing additional training with our staff if there was anything that they needed to learn. We got the chance to talk a little bit about home setup. So Rod's daughter's house is a ranch home, so single level. It does have three to four steps to get in um, and a tub shower. Um, at that time, we also handed out um, like a home eval take take home sheet basically is what we give out so that we can gather some basic information about doorway widths, um, height of the tub, that type of thing, get sort of the ball rolling on us finding out more about that home setup to talk about later. And then um, family just emphasized their main goal is for Rod to get as better as he can, but knowing that they have a likely shorter length of stay than they'll need for him to maximize his, his full return, um, that they would like to see him be as independent as possible with toileting and transfers. Again, being very aware that those two things were going to be big factors for them in whether or not they could make things work safely at home. So timeline of what Rod's stay looks like. I just want to throw in, we didn't put it in the summary, but one of the questions is regarding funds that you have, um, interest in like community resources, um, and usually social, social work kind of takes those on in for us. So Rod's family did say that um, there would be some funding available, but um, they weren't wanting to delve totally into that option at the time they we're hoping to reserve that money for other supports if possible, um, but we're open to using it if needed. So just a little timeline, like I said, of Rod's stay. Um, talking about we had that initial conference, the care partner needs assessment, started talking about home eval, and then we're able to get that home evaluation scheduled um, about, I think it's day 37 of Rod's stay. So we went out to Rod's daughter's house with Rod with us um, and started family training on the spot. Um, we got Rod's daughter, granddaughter, and son-in-law involved in doing some transfers just so they could get a feel of what that assist level looked like in the context of the home. Um, unfortunately, we also found out that that house wasn't quite as accessible as it seemed on paper. While Rod could get his power chair through the doorways and they had a way to add a ramp for him to get into the house, it was difficult to navigate the hallways and turn the width needed to get into the bathroom, into the bedroom, and then the heights of some of the surfaces were difficult for him to achieve or difficult for him to complete a transfer with a second person present in that space, just too small. So already on the way back from the home of Al, um, we as a therapy team, as well as Rod's family, were kind of thinking, yikes, this, this is not looking as well as we hoped it would look. Um, fortunately for us, we had the opportunity to drive by Rod's farm on the way back. He wanted to check fields. And so we got to see what his house looked like and got to thinking, this doesn't seem totally out of the question either. Um, we took that information into his next care conference, so a few days later we sat down as a team, um, therapist there, nursing representative, case management, social work, clinical counselor, and then Rod and his family to talk about how things went. Um, like I said, family was really um, kind of coming to the sum, some of the same awarenesses that we were, like this is going to be a little bit harder than we thought and we're in for a little more than we thought. So because of that, they were very open to looking into other options and scheduling that second home eval where we went to Rod's house. Um, throughout that whole time, we're continuing family training. We're continuing to talk about the list of things that need to be done at daughter's house in case that becomes a discharge plan and the list of training items that we need family to give a go to make sure that they're okay taking Rod home. 
Um, luckily for us, the second home eval was much more successful than the first. Rod's house was more of an open layout. He was able to get his power chair around more easily, and he had two bathroom setups to choose from, um, so could kind of make different alternatives work with equipment. Um, we met a few days later, updated the home recommendations based off of that home eval, put together a new training list for family, and then started to get equipment in the works um, for that, for Rod's house. And by day 71, Rod got to return home to his farm. Um, we did just see Rod in outpatient actually the other day, so I wanted to pass on to you guys that he's doing really well. His granddaughter said that they're no longer using the lift at home for transfers. Um, and that they feel very well supported in the roles that they're in currently. Um, Want to talk a little bit about this. These, I think, were mentioned on the timeline, but I didn't get to dive into them um, too much. This top one, again, sorry, it's small, is called our Care Needs Survey. So this was actually developed by one of the other OTs at On With Life and her student. And we use this sort of on a case-by-case -case basis, um, but it came in very helpful for Rod and his family when thinking about what does that day look like when we take Rod home? When do we really need to be there, those red areas that he's absolutely going to need somebody? And when might he be more okay with just some supervision? So likely his wife being the one that's able to be there to support him at those times. Um, the picture on the bottom is the training list that we had put together for Rod and his family. So this list went to family, it went to his therapy team, it went to nursing, and it, went, it was posted in his room. So this is just a good way to hold us all accountable to what is that list of training goals um, so that when family's there, we as a whole rehab team, nursing therapy, anybody who's in the room can talk to family about how these things are going and check in on whether or not they're cleared to do that. So care partner needs assessment, huge for Rod's um, discharge plan, right? I feel like Rod's, if you guys are like me, and I know some of you worked with Rod, so we had had situations like his in the past where we went in and we knew from the beginning it was gonna be tricky. We didn't get to it until the end that like, where do we fit all the pieces of this? How does this actually come together? Well, because we had this conversation early, we were able to get some of that in place sooner and able to work through those pieces so we didn't have quite as much chaos at the end. It wasn't an easy discharge by any means, but we were, had the pieces kind of in place to work through that with less stress. Um, the care partner needs really helped us stay on track as a team as well. We were all working towards these same goals, right? We're always working to meet persons or goal, but we all kind of had this like-minded approach for Rod. We knew what the plan was, who needed trained, what they needed trained on, what things were gonna look like at home. Um, and then I think for him especially, this helped open up doors of communication for us and family, right? Ever since that care partner needs assessment, his family was reaching out to us, asking questions, giving us feedback about what kinds of things were going on. Um, at one point, Rod's Grandson was sick, and so we were working back and forth on, is this gonna affect the discharge plan? How does this change your availability for training? And family was very, very open about having those conversations with us because we got to build rapport in this conversation early on. Okay. <clears throat> All right, I will jump in. I'm gonna talk about Sandy. Sandy is a vivacious, motivated, lovely person. Um, she, early on in life, she was a nurse. Um, when they moved to Ames, her and her husband, um, he is also in healthcare, had already said earlier in their marriage they would never work at the same place. So the only option for both of them was Mary Greeley. So Sandy changed her life plan and she became a travel agent. Um, she traveled the world with her husband, had wonderful adventures. She talks about them for a long time wonderfully. She's very eloquent. Um, but Sandy suffered a right CVA. Um, she was at her primary care physician's office and the nurse came out to get her, to get her and she was actually slumped over in her chair. Um, and so they had to send her across the street in an ambulance, which is a touchy subject that she couldn't just walk over there. It was a big deal. Um, <clears throat> and she had suffered this stroke. So Sandy had the pretty kind of typical right side stroke 
deficits, left hemiplegia, left inattention, she had some incontinence issues, um, impaired strength and endurance, moderate impairments in attention, memory, and insight. When Sandy came to us, she had a Sarah lift for transfers, needing assist of two people, um, and she was maxed to total assist for all of her ADLs and bed mobility. When Sandy came to us, her and her husband's main plan was home. Um, whatever that looked like, they wanted her home. Um, and plan B was this kind of extra piece. Still home, but willing to pay, doing this private pay um, and support as needed. Sandy's original length of stay was 29 days. Um, she was also Medicare, so she came to us with just a few weeks of her days used. So we knew that we had the option to extend her stay as long as she's making those FIM gains. Um, we knew the thing that kind of flagged Sandy was we had looked through her notes and kind of seen that she had made some good progress, but it was taking a while to make those gains. Um, so we knew that the rate of her progress was likely not going to kind of match up with the rate um, of her discharge and the time we were going to have with her. So um, we had flagged her early. The information we obtained before she came regarding home setup and just some kind of tidbits were that her husband would be able to provide 24-7 supervision as well as physical assistance and that they had an accessible apartment. <clears throat> so we completed um, Sandy's CPNA um, after her first conference. We had kind of put it on the radar that we wanted to do it and we had extended her stay at that point. So we knew we had a little bit of wiggle room with planning of that. After sitting down with her and her husband, um, we kind of talked through a lot of things, and the biggest thing being um, Sandy and her husband kind of realized this 24-7 thing was not real. It wasn't, it wasn't um, what they had thought. Um, her husband was very candid, saying that, you know, I, I didn't think about sleeping. I guess I have to sleep too. And, oh yeah, I do have that coffee group that I go to a couple times a week and I still have to do groceries and I go to Mayo once a month for a couple days overnight. And all these things that kind of hadn't fit into their picture were able to be talked about. Um, physical assistance wise, her husband said that he would be able to provide contact guard to Minisyst. Minisyst being kind of the high end. Um, he had a bad back, history of rotator cuff surgery, uh, bad knee, um, so just really not physically able to help her a whole lot. They did state um, that their son would be able to provide some assistance, but he works full time um, and really couldn't consistently commit to help. Um, Sandy was comfortable with her husband helping with intimate cares, um, and her husband was very comfortable. As I said, he was in the medical field. Same thing with comfort level, with um, administering meds, if she had any wounds, that type of thing. Um, he was very comfortable with this as well because of his experience. He <clears throat> had availability for training um, daily, hands-on training. He was ready to jump in whenever it was appropriate at that contact guard to meniscus level. Also jumping in on other things that maybe didn't take that physical help. He was very willing. We just had her graduation party. When person serve leave on with life, we do a graduation party to celebrate them. And Sandy said that he only missed two days the whole time she was there. So he had committed and he meant it. Um, their home setup was a third floor apartment um, with elevator access. It was a two bedroom, two bathroom open concept. Um, had linoleum, or laminate, I'm sorry, and low ply carpeting. And a walk-in shower in both bathrooms that had a lip of five or six inches and a built-in um, shower seat. Their main goal, as I mentioned, was to return home. Um, this was a very big goal of theirs. They were very proud of this um, place that they lived. They'd only been there, I think, a year and a half or so before this happened, and so they really just wanted to get back to life. Very understandable. Um, they obviously wanted her to regain strength um, and get to that minimal assistance level so that he would be able to help her in the home. Um, so we are going to have you do answer these questions again. The main ones to focus on are what are red flags um, and then what other questions do you have about Sandy and her plan. The pages that Abby handed out now have a little more detailed information than I talked through so you can, you can kind of look through those that'll help with your discussion. We'll come back in a second.
All right. We would like you to throw out any questions, further questions that you have from the information we gave you and I kind of talked about. Anything major sticking out to you that we missed? What was the question? Sorry, Ali. Okay, who's gonna be a second assist? <clears throat> so they have a small family, it's just her son. Um, and so they didn't, they didn't have that. They didn't have anyone else that would be able to step in and provide that. We did talk through, I'm gonna talk a little more here too, but we did talk through other supports that they might need, obviously. Um, and they were open to that. Um, but the reality is healthcare, everyone is hurting right now, right, for staffing. So for us to put all of our eggs into that basket that they would be able to get the help that they needed as often as they needed um, was just kind of too big a beast to take on. Go ahead. How much did their long-term care insurance offer? <clears throat> Yeah, that wasn't, it wasn't covered. Mm -mm. Nope, it was covered in a facility. Erin, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was covered in a facility, but not at home. It wasn't going to help them out at home. Yeah. That was something that came up. That is something that came up during the care partner needs. They didn't know a whole lot about it. They knew that they had this long-term um, thing, but they didn't really know the ins and outs of it. Um, so that is one thing. Social Work jumped in and did a great job. Um, kind of getting the details and ins and outs of that. Anything else, Major? So I'm going to say, correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys had way less questions with Sandy. Would you agree? Okay. So I'm going to kind of talk through the rest of Sandy's journey after the CPNA. Um, immediately after, did you do it already? Immediately after um, we had this conversation, we collaborated with social work um, as well as the rehab team regarding the barriers that were really sticking out to us about this plan A. Um, also, we really tried to empower Sandy's husband to have these frank and honest conversations with her. We could kind of read that he was feeling like this wasn't gonna work, but that's a really hard thing to admit to someone, your loved one, like, I'm not comfortable with this. So we tried to support him through that. We also collaborated with a therapy team regarding the importance of really targeting those heavy assist type parts of her day, including transfers, bed mobility, toileting, um, collaborated with nursing regarding incontinence and maybe what we could work on and do about that. We completed a home evaluation a week later, um, which we scheduled during the care partner needs. The This allowed us to very first and best, I would say, best thing that came out of it was Sandy was super pumped to be home. Um, it was a goal of hers to be home, and I think the fact that she just even got a taste of home really kind of rejuvenated her, and she was real happy about it, so that was great. Um, it facilitated open and honest conversations about discharge, so being in the setting that their plan was and to talk through how that would work was huge. Um, it really provided that insight that and kind of um, reassurance to Sandy's husband um, that it was gonna be tough and it was gonna take a lot. Um, this allowed us to talk through that plan B. Um, and we really hit hard with Sandy, the fact that you're making this progress. We really hope that this is just, a plan B would just be a step between us and home. Um, we really think you're gonna achieve these goals. You're doing great things, they're just not, kind of at the rate that we have time for, to be very honest, and, and they took that well. This was also the first time that we heard um, her husband be pretty candid with her about his comfort level, the fact that he didn't think this was gonna work and that he wanted to really kind of look into this plan B. Uh, we obviously gave them the recommendations for the home setup, knowing that if she did have a step between us, that might change, she's gonna continue to get better, but this was just as is, here are our recommendations. It also provided us to have a conversation about future home passes that she could complete. Um, we talked about her son kind of being the muscle. And so we talked through, you know, Sandy, you could go home for an afternoon as long as your son is there to do those transfers and help you kind of get around. Um, and she thought that was pretty great. 
Um, Sandy did end up discharging to a skilled facility, and while Plan A was not her first option, their first option, um, they did feel prepared. They voiced that to us. They were very, very confident in the fact that this was just a step between. They had kind of come to terms with that. Um, and the CPNA really kind of gave us that jumping off point to guide us through those conversations. So um, just want to talk a little bit about the differences between Rod and Sandy here. On paper, Rod was really daunting, right? A lot of us were like, well, I don't think discharge to home is going to work. Um, but because we had these conversations, um, we were able to really problem solve through that early. Um, and because he had the support at home and could get some lifting equipment into his home as well, we had time to figure out what was going to work best for him and to get that into place. Um, he was able to make that successful transition. And on the surface of Sandy's, it all sounded great, right? 24-hour supervision, 24-7 physical assistance, accessible home. Um, it all sounded really good. But as we dove in with the CPNA, we were able to build a fuller picture of those gaps that were present, right? Um, it helped us kind of support the reality that this plan was really not a great plan, but also to give them the knowledge to make that decision on their own. It's not our call, ultimately not our call, but we did give them the resources to make, a, make that kind of informed decision. Oh, nope. So to kind of transition a little bit, um, there were some tough conversations we had to have with Sandy. Um, you know, they both came into their stay at On With Life thinking this is, it's this and then home, right? This is what a lot of people, we experience this a lot. Um, and to have those conversations and feel a little bit like a dream crusher, you know, like that, oh, I'm so sorry. I just, I don't know if we're going to get there. It feels, uh, feels daunting. It feels like a lot. It feels heavy. Um, these conversations are going to feel clunky. <laughs> you're going to feel like you're pushing things and bringing up things that are just whoa, they're not ready for that, right? Um, it's never going to be an easy conversation. Um, for me, with Sandy, I felt good about it, even in those hard times, because I know that as a whole, as a team, we're all advocating for her, her safety, her well-being, um, what's going to meet her needs. Um, and that just kind of gave us a little bit peace of mind. Um, I know that Sandy will get home someday. I really have every confidence in her, but this was just not really in the cards for her right from, it, right from on with life. Um, us as clinicians have to have these hard conversations. Uh, we're not really kind of doing our, doing our due diligence and doing our duty um, and owning our experience and our knowledge um, to support them through and make those tough decisions if we don't have the conversation. Um, it's also very empowering um, to know that I have this stuff to draw from, right? I, I've, I've seen this before. No brain injury is the same. We all know that. But um, we do have kind of a general collective experience that you can draw from and know how those things can go. Um, and this CPNA really just kind of gives you a roadmap to those conversations. So big thing here is just that we want to kind of acknowledge the fact that and normalize that these things are going to be tough. These convos are going to be tough. It's a great time for you to build rapport with families. Um, it really helps you allow them the time to cope and process, even if it feels like, oh my gosh, we're having this conversation way early. Emily's talked about the crunch of that last couple of weeks. If we waited in too long, they would be feeling the crunch and coping, right? Coping doesn't end, but we're giving them more time. Um, we don't always love that we have to have these conversations, but who else is going to have them, right? They, they um, expect us to be doing our jobs, and our job is this, to do the planning, have the hard conversations, um, that type of thing. Um, coming from someone who's not good at the hard conversation, that's not my game. That's not what I do. You, there are ways to get yourself through this, right? First and foremost, like Jess said, knowing this is what we're here for, right? We're here for our person served, and because of that, we're here for their care partners. And the best way for us to support them is to give them all the tools that we can by having these conversations early. Um, we can remind them that... We want your loved one to get as better as they can, and we would love to keep them here in whatever this setting may be 
as long as we can, but we know that we don't get to. We only have so much time, and because of that, we wanna make sure that we're using it to do the best we can for you and getting you ready to go. Um, we also wanna think about you know, knowing that this conversation is gonna be hard for them and making that it okay that they know that. It can even be okay for them to know this conversation's gonna be hard for me too. I don't like having to talk about this, um, but I know that, it, again, it's gonna do right by you if we have this conversation now. Um, I would encourage all of you, I know lots of different settings across the board, right? This is just kind of how we look at it for the inpatient model, but leaning into those tough conversations and whatever the nature may be um, will take us really far. Maybe. Um, so just a couple things to keep in mind with this too. It's not just one conversation. This is our jumping off point, like we've said. This is the lead in to really processing how this could go. It's building chips, um, it's building insight along the way. So it's just a starting point. Um, some other things to be mindful of are just any personal biases that you might be bringing into this conversation. So I might be going into Rod's conversation saying, I don't like this, it's not good. I don't want you to do it because I don't feel safe about it. Well, it's family's choice ultimately, and if they can make it work, they get to make it work, right? Same thing, I might have someone who's like, boy, I've, all you have to do is provide supervision. Why can't you do that? Again, that's family's choice in that conversation, and we just have to really go into this open-minded and ready to hear what's on their plate and what they can make work. One, One thing, thing that, that was, was frequently, frequently challenged, challenged while I was creating the caregiver, caregiver training was, was my own assumptions and my own bias, my own expectations because of working with many clients, clients over the years and a different family, family that dynamics. dynamics. I, I would see families where myself, I was incredibly nervous, nervous about them taking their, their loved one home, home because of the amount of dependency that that, that client would have on that family member but they, they still, still would take, take the client, client home. And then, then I would see other situations where the client barely needed supervision, maybe occasional contact guard assist, and the family was really resistant to taking the loved one home. And I felt within myself this, but why, why won't you take them home? They're your loved one. And, and I, really I really have to challenge myself to not put myself in that space because every family is different, every dynamic is different. The roles of those individuals in the family can be completely different. So we don't want to place our own personal presumptions, biases, general assumptions on that family without recognizing that we're only seeing a tiny little blip in time. And we have to respect that family's wishes and their knowledge and having the conversation opens them up to problem solving with us. Having the conversation opens them up to considering all of the factors. And we have to be willing to, to go, go on that journey, journey with them, them regardless, regardless of where the, the clients end up. So things we've learned along the way. Um, <clears throat> setting clear expectations is, is key. Um, this includes setting a date and time that you're gonna complete the CPNA, as well as training. This holds family accountable, the team accountable. Um, it kind of keeps everybody on track and engaged in the goals and the plan. Uh, we had to do some of these because of COVID virtual or on the phone. And we would really encourage if you're going to take this on to do these in person. Um, there's a lot of benefit to that. You can read their body language, the families. Um, you can kind of see how they're taking the questions. Can I push a little bit and ask maybe some more? Or do I just kind of need to let it lie? Um, there's also a lot of power in the family member knowing how much you care about their loved one and showing that through you being vulnerable in that conversation and very honest. Um, get them hands on as soon as you can. Um, this doesn't have to be transfers. It could be medical needs. It could just be 
managing a lift that we're hopeful that they won't have when they leave. Anytime you can get family involved, that's huge. Empower nursing staff to empower the family too. There's tons of knowledge to tap in there. They're with person served so much more than we are and they have just unique rapport built there. Um, difficult conversations are gonna be difficult. We haven't tried to sugarcoat that. That's gonna be, it's gonna be hard. Um, but acknowledging that and owning that and owning your knowledge is key. And communication within the team is vital. I'm gonna skip ahead a few for you guys. Keep going. Change, Change is really, really hard. hard. There it is. Okay, so big why. Why implement something like this, right? We are doing right by our families when we're taking care of them and taking care of their, par their care partners. When we invest in them, we're investing in the quality of life for our person served beyond the setting they're in right now. Um, their importance cannot be understated. And um, they're the reason that we do what we do. So we want to leave you guys with a few words from Casey about this as well. Okay, so, so the, the top three reasons, reasons why I think, think you should implement a caregiver assessment. assessment. Number, Number one, one timing, timing is really important, important and, and starting these conversations early in a client's recovery period is really important for the family for insight into, you know, what recovery may look like from here to build a relationship as well as the family members recognizing that we see, we see them. them. We, we see the impact, impact of a transition in roles, how a spouse may be transitioning in, in many ways to a new life role of being, being a caregiver, caregiver as, as well as a spouse, and the impact that, that can have. I think, I think it's a powerful conversation, and I think it can be a really scary conversation for some clinicians who didn't feel like they had the power to, or felt like, like it was too soon, you didn't know enough about how the person would progress. We know a lot more about prognosis. We've seen enough to recognize where a client might be at the end of that, and to kind of own our knowledge, and be willing to have the conversation, even though it's scary. I think it really does assist with the, the family, uh, being supportive of the therapeutic process, but also starting to realistically consider the impact on their lives in transitioning to this new role. We want to just give a special thanks to Casey, um, who is a passionate advocate for care partners. She's enthusiastic, um, and she was wonderful in collaborating um, with this presentation and our programming. Do we have one more? Do we have time for questions? Do we have time for questions at all? Okay, one minute. No pressure. <laughs> So for Sandy's case, she went, was it more of a long-term transition that she went to? They had skilled yep. setting there, but she was yep. using long-term yep. um, days, not her skilled days there. Mm -hmm. Good question. Any other questions? Cool, thanks guys.